Newburn was restricted or banned, then in my view there would be a huge impact on welfare prevention. Wildfires have become more prevalent and of greater intensity. For me it's always been difficult when you read a headline like peatland burning. It's not peatland burning. If anything, it actually prevents the peatland to burn. Heather burning is one tool to help in the mitigation of wildfire risk. I'm Area Commander Bruce Farquharson. I look after the service delivery for Aberdeen City, Aberdeenshire and Murray. I also have the national responsibility for welfare across all of Scotland and as part of that responsibility I chair the Scottish Welfare Forum. Muirburn's a really important aspect for land management in my view. The ability to manage the fuel and create a mosaic pattern across the countryside of different um, types of burn uh, so fuel in different conditions from freshly burned to regenerating to needing burned allows us the opportunity when we do get wildfires to have that broken fuel continuation. So we, the fire shouldn't spread as quickly or as far and it gives us areas where we know we are safe from the fire that we can mount our operations from. So muir burns are a really effective way of controlling the fuel or vegetation that is on the hillside but also for allowing us opportunities to fight fires when they do happen. The Scottish Government is seeking to ban Muirburn on peatlands. The indication is that this will be on all areas with a peat depth of 40 centimetres or more. Why is this? We looked at the science underpinning the 40 centimetre peat depth rule. A recent review of the evidence base commissioned by Nature Scott concluded that there was a lack of evidence to determine the impacts of Muirburn on different depths of peat. As Scotland's nature regulators say, the evidence base for a restriction based on 40 centimetres peak depth is flimsy. Moreover, these films express the views of leading researchers, wildfire mitigation experts, and experienced practitioners working at the sharp end of prescribed burning today. All are concerned at the prospect of muir burn restrictions for peat's sake and for public safety when it comes to wildfire. Recently published science from the north of England is clear. When Muirburn is carried out in season by skilled practitioners, the peat itself is not damaged, so the carbon stored there is not released. The weight of recent science says Muirburn is more likely to keep carbon in our peatlands by preventing hotter, uncontrolled fires. I'm Andreas Heinemeyer and I'm a senior researcher or associate professor here at the Environment and Geography Department at the University of York. It is a controversial issue, uh, prescribed burning, but firstly is it actually a, a controversial issue very much UK centred because it's mixed up with so many other issues with preconceptions, with disliking certain management, certain activities, certain ownerships, I guess. That's where it becomes really muddy, the water. And I think, as a scientist, what I try to do is look through that to, to really focus on the actual issue of prescribed burning. Uh, so for me, it's always been difficult when you read a headline like peatland burning. It's not peatland burning. If anything, it actually prevents the peatland to burn. It burns vegetation in a prescribed way to counteract a fire risk which then is likely to burn into the peat and then you have a burning peatland which nobody wants. The land mentioned either, the public certainly not and the water company not. Uh, but so we, we need to separate those issues of headline news, uh, putting it all in a in a bad basket like wow this is always bad. Uh, because when we look outside the UK, prescribed burning is a tool which is managed and seen as a vital tool to prevent wildfires. Uh, it has been done so for, for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Uh, and there is a wealth of knowledge of how to do it, when to do it, when not to do it, and how not to do it. And I think the UK is slowly opening up to that, to reaching out to 
uh, managers to, to, to scientists in Spain, in Portugal, in, in, in areas where a hotter climate has been part of the equation for much longer and where Heather Mullins have experienced fires for much longer and that's becoming now relevant in the UK. We can't ignore that. I just work as a wildfire analyst in the Catalonian Fire Service and for the European Union Civil Protection System. And uh, I am a fire ecologist as a background. So I've been working the last 25 years in wildfire around the world, mainly Europe, North and South America. I do a lot of analysis and strategic analysis during the wildfire season, but I also do a lot of landscape planning to, to allow the the fire service to, to work on the fires, but also to build resilient landscapes. And that's what brought me to the United Kingdom. So I, I get in contact with the fire service, but I get in contact with, with different projects that they needed to manage the landscape to avoid big wildfires, or to make sure that a wildfire doesn't change the whole biodiversity and the whole ecosystem in an area. So it's, it's, I work mainly at the bridge between land management and fire management. You know, there, there is no justification to say that gamekeepers are burning peat. That just, it doesn't happen, it doesn't make sense. It, you know, it would be extremely harmful to us to burn the peat. You know, at the end of the day, if we burn the peat, there is no heather for the grouse and for the rest of the moorland birds. It just doesn't make any sense. And I mean, the problem we have with these large fuel loads is when the fire happens, which is inevitable, then we, the peat is burnt, everything is burnt, there is nothing left. And it takes years and years and years for it to correct itself. I would say that the wildfire assistance we get from gamekeepers and other land managers is absolutely essential and critical to the uh, effort we can make to fight the fire. Some form of burning rotation is really useful in breaking up the uh, vegetation canopy because in that way you have some areas of short heather or short vegetation, some areas of long vegetation and it means that the overall moorland biomass is reduced and hence is a lower fuel load. So when the heather has been burnt back if a fire does come through, it's likely to burn with less intensity because there's less fuel to burn. So the fire will not have the opportunity to penetrate into the soil depths. And it's the peat that's the real key to carbon capture. If the peat becomes involved in the fire, and in a wildfire it's more likely to, then it will release massive amounts of carbon into the atmosphere. And we saw an example on the north coast of Scotland in 2019 at the Strathy fire, where the carbon emission for the year was doubled over the period of a six day fire because the fire intensity above ground was such that it got into the peat and eroded that carbon capture. So muir burn is absolutely an essential part to preventing wildfire and is not the main cause of wildfires in Scotland. The problem is that when you deal with fire, you cannot, you have to differentiate what is a normal day fire, which is a dry, hot day, and which is a extreme day fire, which is a dry, hot day that, it, that happens when you have a drought, already in place and when they, you have dry wind blowing over your area. And those things happen more often now than they used to happen before because the climate is changing. It means Greenland is melting, the North Atlantic water is cooling down, so the high pressure systems travel slower. And those high pressure systems build bridges over the coast, the Atlantic coast in Europe and that leaves air with that movement over the area, which starts to, to cook a little bit and heat it up. And then it forces a blow from the east, which is dry wind, into the area. So it's a perfect condition for extreme wildfires, like the one in 2018. So understand those fires and understand how we can manage our landscape to make sure we can fight them it's an important issue because normally when we deal with a fire we think with our normal experience of fire but at that moment we are having it's a new type of fire over the area and that change is the one we, we are 
introducing in the planning in the big district. I think one of the big benefits of having a gamekeeper community is that they tend to work together, especially on things like wildfire risk. And in my view, every moorland unit, not an estate, it's got to be bigger than its single estates, moorland units need to have a wildfire uh, mitigation and control plan. One of the, the good things about having good gamekeepers on the ground is that many of them are skilled in fire fighting uh, and uh, they tend to pull together within a moorland unit to help each other out and the kit that they now routinely have uh, available for this job are, is much greater than the old fire beaters and fire floggers that uh, uh, are seen on the television occasionally. The, you know, the, the, the use of fire fog, proper fire fogging equipment, uh, leaf blowers and all this sort of thing. Uh, and if push comes to shove, actually, uh, you know, cutting or ploughing fire breaks to try and help the, the, the stop the spread of fire uh, really is very, very useful. Well, when you compare burning of vegetation, not the peat of vegetation that is, to alternative cutting, that there are certain trade-offs. So it's not clear-cut bad or good for either of those managements. And it gets even more complicated when you look at the other alternative of not managing the vegetation at all. Uh, maybe I'll start with the latter one. So not managing at all, what you end up is with quite old aging heather. And like with forests, when you become very old, your respiration, your losses of carbon for maintaining yourself increase year after year because your biomass just gets bigger. But you're also getting older, you are getting less efficient, like we humans tend to. That's the same with aging vegetation. So it's less efficient at taking up carbon. And that's what we measure in the field. But also what people didn't maybe quite think about is that when you have very tall heather, you have lots of leaves, you transpire, you lose lots of water. Where do you get that water from? From the peat. So old, aging, big heather tends to dry out the peat and that's what we find at power sites. And now that is a very big concern because locking away carbon in peatlands relies on peat being wet. Anything which dries it is bad. So drainage is one extreme, but aging heather seems to be another one. So the benefit of either management would be to reduce that water loss, keep the peat wetter. In Scotland, we term it muir burn. The rest of the world terms it as prescribed burning. Prescribed burning has gone on through Native Americans, the Aboriginals in Scotland, we have the moorland gamekeepers. We, we've had fire in Scotland and the north of England for over 150 years burning for grouse. But this, the Wildfire Forum Group, it's not about grouse. You know, these large areas which are now under regeneration, if muir burn or prescribed burn, burning was carried out in those areas, it would then provide us with natural fire breaks where it would be much, much easier to fight the fires. Rewetting is not a solution because rewetting means that you will have enough water to keep that wet. And the problem with fire is that it happens when you get a drought. And those rewetting ecosystems that consume a lot more water than the normal ecosystem are the first ones that will fail under the drought. And we've seen that all over the world. That has been tried in a lot of places. And when you see the rainforest burning, is when you realize the thing will never work. I've seen that through my eyes and I had that experience. So back in the 70s, we tried to rewet around the rivers in Spain because it was water and we could maintain a, a wetter ecosystem that will, will work as a full break. Well, those, those wet full breaks were the, were the drivers of the, fire, the fires in the 90s. And the same is happening Today, in British Columbia, you go into the news, you look at the satellite, you will see British Columbia burning. That rainforest is one of the wettest forests in the world. 
but six months of drought and high temperatures has been enough to create more than five million hectares burned right now. So we lose the whole ecosystem because we were basing our, our strategy in a myth and that will not work. When, when we look at uh, comparing burning and cutting in our study, what we actually see is, well, take carbon for example, oh, well, it, it relies of course of biomass taking up carbon, fixing it and then letting the litter drop and form peat over time by organic matter decomposing over time or not so in peatlands because they're cold and wet. Um, but with burning, we have another aspect. Uh, during combustion, of course, you lose a lot of carbon to the atmosphere. You see it, uh, smoke, gone up in smoke. But actually what you might overlook is that during burning, in complete combustion, you create a form of biochar, charcoal, because it's incomplete combustion. The burning of the heather is under cold and wet conditions, it's not with good oxygen supply, so you create charcoal, and quite a lot of it actually, and that is part of a peatland's long-term carbon budget. You actually find charcoal layers when you take out a peat core, and they might be thousands or hundreds of years old, but that stuff doesn't tend to decompose, so it's locked away carbon, but we need to add that to the carbon balance, and Oh well, consider the losses of carbon from combustion, but we need to include all of those aspects to then compare the carbon balance of that burned, prescribed burned peatland to an alternative cut one. Now there you don't lose, that's what we find, huge emissions after the cutting, but you find losses which are quite large year after year after year, because like with your lawn clippings, mostly they will decompose. It just takes longer. So that's why the reviewers pointed out we need a 20 year long study for once to actually allow us compare apples and apples and not apples and pears because you get a completely different carbon balance when you just have five years. Burning looks like a huge enormous loss compared to any other option. But when you go for 20 years, whoa, it looks completely different those initial combustion losses are actually very low when you look at it over a 20-year cycle, whereas the decomposition of brush becomes very large when you add year after year together. So all of a sudden, it actually looks now like that in the right conditions where a peatland is wet enough and you burn and you don't damage the vegetation underneath the moss layer, which is very important, then that additional charcoal together with a very small loss year after year from the initial combustion actually might lock away more carbon, it could be, than when you cut it and you let it to decompose. So we need to have an open mind, I think, and an open debate uh, without those issues influencing your perception of things. We need to look at the actual evidence. We are fearful that Scottish Government could regulate Muirburn in a way that would be detrimental to the aim of keeping carbon in our peatlands, which we want too, but it is also detrimental for wildfire mitigation. As we heard earlier, restricting Muirburn using peat depth as a measure lacks an evidential basis. We feel there is a better way for the Government and the Parliament to achieve its aims. We call on the Scottish Government to ban the intentional or reckless burning of peat, imposing sanctions where peat is damaged and carbon is lost. This simple measure would protect peatlands from reckless and irresponsible activity, but would still allow skilled Muirburn to continue to deliver the important environmental benefits for Scotland mentioned in these films. For Pete's sake, we hope the Scottish Government and the Parliament will listen.